In which case, I think we are live and I think we're working. I think it's 10 o'clock and hopefully this is going to work. Uh, and so this is the first episode of Resourceful, episode one. My name's Tom Manners on Twitter. I'm at Manomatics and you can tweet me during this. Uh, we will try and pay attention to what's going on there. So I introduce myself first and foremost, but there's about to be a bit of music, which there shouldn't be. And it, good, it disappeared. So thank you for tuning in. Let's get started. I'm the PGC tutor for maths at Arthur Terry Teaching School. And the reason I share that is because obviously I've got the huge responsibility of bringing new people into the profession. And so it's my job to be in kind of aware of the new websites, the new resources, the new research and everything that's going on across the world. And I, I certainly got a lot of that by doing my uh, master's, which I completed last year at University of Birmingham. Uh, I got a distinction. I don't need to mention that. I just choose to. Um, so I did my master's and it was my way of really embracing research and certainly being PGC tutor Arthur Terry. Um, it's something that I do a lot of now, making sure I know what's going on in the maths world. And I'm always learning. I'm certainly not going to sit here doing this series thinking I know it all. I want to learn from experts. And that's why I'm going to be interviewing people each and every week. Um, Arthur Terry, by the way, if you do know anyone who wants to be a teacher in the West Midlands, come and train with me or with the great team at Arthur Terry. Uh, I am also an NCTM PD lead, a professional development lead. In other words, I love sharing what I know and I love talking to maths teaching. And that's exactly why I'm doing this resourceful series. Uh, I work as a consultant for two days a week, uh, and part of that is working with the NCTM. I'm a teaching mastery specialist, mastery in inverted commas. If you wonder why I put them in inverted commas, I've got a uh, couple of CPDs on my YouTube channel. You might want to watch that and see why I do that. Um, but I'm a work group lead as well. Uh, if you're not aware of what the maths hubs are, um, I'm going to continue to say this until the cows come home. There are 40 of them around the country now. It's just increased to make sure we can be even more thorough, I suppose, supporting everyone around, uh, around England. If you have not ever signed up, join the mailing list. There are so many um, opportunities going on. And oddly enough, everyone involved in today's session is involved with the Maths Hubs and is a Teaching for Mastery Specialist, which is fabulous. And the five big ideas of Teaching for Mastery, again, inverted commas, um, people say what, different things about mastery, but I think this is hugely about teaching for understanding. And the resource we're looking at today is very much about understanding. Uh, and I think it really incorporates a lot of these uh, five big ideas, and I'm looking forward to delving into them. So uh, it says Fridays, because I have been doing sessions before half term on Fridays. Let me just tell you what I'm doing on Fridays going forward for the rest of half term. I'm going to be covering each of these five big ideas. Uh, each week, I'm going to be joined by a primary mastery specialist from one of the maths hubs. Uh, so we are covering primary and secondary. Uh, I know I'm secondary background, but I have a huge interest in primary and the transition between the two. And so I think it's really important that when I do these sessions, I have primary experts on as well. So next Friday, I'm starting with variation, Faye Glenning, uh, Faye Glendinning, sorry. Um, she's from the Central Maths Hub. She's a teaching for mastery specialist. Great energy. I spoke with her yesterday about this session. Really looking forward to that. Uh, so next Friday at 10 o'clock, I'm going to be doing this again on this YouTube channel. Um, however, we want, I want to do something new. And I've had this goal for a long time. Even when I left my first school, which I loved my first school, I said, uh, they asked me why I'm leaving. And I said, I want to teach teachers. I want to work with teachers. Uh, and I went to Arthur Terry as PGC tutor saying, I want to do something new. I want to do something unique. And I, I think, I'm hoping this will be it. Uh, and I had that feeling. And oh, well, I was listening to my 80s music because I'm a bit of an 80s music fan. And um, Phil Collins always comes on. And I felt it come in the air. I've been waiting for this moment. I think this should be fun. It should be interesting. Resourceful. We're here. I went through a lot of drama trying to choose the name and I'll, I need to tell you more about that a little bit later on. But this series of interviews will focus on the amazing online resources that are freely available for maths teachers everywhere. We're gonna have uh, talk about what are they, explained by the creators. So I'm gonna ask the questions, why, when, and how to use them. Uh, a friend of mine used an expression the other day, uh, what's the exact words of this? You can give a tiger a great book, but he won't know how to read it. Um, I think the point being that if you got the tools, if you don't know how to use those tools, they're, they're ineffective. And so the idea being that I'm going to be the person hearing from the experts, the creators, and I'm going to think of those questions that say, look, how do we use these effectively in the classroom? How do we make, what problems are going to be and why? How do we overcome those? Can they be a starter? Can they be used, I don't know, as an extension? Could they be at the start of the work? Could they, do they explain the work? So it's really important that when you get given these resources, and we often just get given stuff, we don't think about how to interact with them. And that's what I really, really enjoy personally. Um, you can't, you also, I assume you're watching live and asking questions on YouTube. I haven't been had any message shouted at me saying we're not working. So I think I'm live on YouTube right now. Um, there's along the side, I think that side is looking at me. 
Uh, you can type questions. Producer Adam, are you there? I am here. Yay, from Arthur's home, my head of the department, and he's volunteering to help with these. Thank you again, Adam. I sent you free ice cream as a thank you for this already, so <laughs> you, owe, you, you owe me a number of weeks now. <laughs> um, I'm going to try and stay across my mobile phone over here and look at the, result, uh, the hashtag resourceful, uh, and hopefully that internet will work. I'm going to have to put it nearer that way, so we'll see. Uh, so then, let's get started. Resourceful. We start with more same less.co.uk. It's a new website in the last few weeks. Uh, it's really good thinking. And so I asked to welcome to the stage. Come on down, Ashton and Peter. Dun, 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 dun. Hi, Tom. Dun, 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 dun. For those who remember the price is right. Ashton, do you remember the price is right, Leslie Crowd? I do, I do, yes. You do? Okay. Yes. Super stuff. Now, you two have created this website, but you're not the only guest today because you're both secondary mastery specialists as well. And I want to make sure this isn't one big NCTM love-in, by the way, um, yeah, because there are going to be sessions that aren't to do with the NCTM. We just all happen to be specialists today. <laughs> but we've got a third one because I happen to have heard some brand new news about your website this morning, all thanks to this lady, Jean. Come on down. Dun, 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 dun. Is she still there? Yes. <laughs> Jean, can't get, get, there we go, Jean, thank you so much for getting involved with this as well. Um, I'm just, I hope I haven't embarrassed you already. Um, maybe at this stage, we all introduce ourselves, tell us about what we do at the moment. Um, I mentioned we're all teaching for mastery specialists uh, and we'll get into the website in a minute. And so we start, of course, ladies first. Um, so two days a week, I'm a teacher in um, two different schools in Slough um, and mainly teaching mathematics. Um, to year six um, and a little bit of other year groups as well. And then three days a week, I'm an independent consultant, but um, I've had experience in being a university lecturer in ITT, consultant and teacher as well. Um, so this is the perfect balance, teaching and a bit of consultancy. It's brilliant. Do you know what? I'm loving my life at the moment because I still get to be in the classroom and working with tra trainee teachers is so good. The, the, the enthusiasm, it's... It, it, I am loving my job at the moment. I truly am. Um, so we know a little bit about Jean. Um, Ashton, tell us about yourself. Yes, yeah, so um, I'm a secondary maths teacher. Um, just that this was my first year doing the NCTM um, Mastery Specialist Programme. Um, I'm only an RQT. Uh, it was my NQT year last year. Um, yeah, I just... I've. I work at a tiny school with three maths teachers, um, but it's an all through school. So I've had the opportunity to work with uh, some primary as well this year, which has been really fun. Um, and I've learned a lot. Yeah, that's about it, really. I, would... I, I love the fact you were involved with this so soon as well. And, you, and even in your second year of teaching, you're reaching out and supporting everyone. And that was the idea of this resourceful series, that there are so many resources online. It, it, it's just brilliant. I don't think there's ever been a better time to be a maths teacher. Uh, I really believe at the moment that things that the NCTM are doing are in line with Ofsted's in line with latest research as well. Um, but there's so much stuff online that people aren't necessarily aware of. Uh, people probably are aware of, um, of this. And so they should be because the author of it, even though the picture on screen kind of gives that away as well. Uh, Pete's joined us as well. Pete, we thank you. For, thank you for doing this. Uh, tell us about yourself. Um, so I, four days a week, I run a maths department in Leicestershire in an 11 to 16 school. Um, currently, actually, I'm seconded to our SLT as well to cover maternity. So it's been a busy... Don't do it! No, it's been a busy and fun time doing the timetable and supporting the SLT through what has been a very interesting couple of weeks, to say the least. Yeah, I can imagine. Um, I've been running maths departments for nearly a decade now. And then the one day a week that I don't work here, I work actually as the secondary mastery lead for East Midland South Maths Hub. So I was part of uh, the first cohort, cohort one for NCTM secondary mastery specialist program. So that was like when obviously it had been launched with primaries a couple of years before, but I was part of the first secondary cohort and went through that uh, over the last three years. Uh, that finished a couple of years ago, cohort one, and have been secondary mastery lead for East Midland South since then. Good on, and of course the book and this other websites with you, uh, Pete. Today we're focusing on this one, but I've got a feeling I'm going to have to pick your brains another day about your other websites because uh, you've got some humdingers. Um, yeah, however, let's that, move yeah. on to uh, more same less. What will this session include? Uh, an introduction to the website and the tasks within it. Um, we haven't planned how we're going to do that between us all, so we'll just shout in. Well, I won't. You guys will. 
Um, one of the benefits of using these tasks, not only to the pupil, of course, and the teacher, how to use them in the classrooms, both primary and secondary, including how to introduce the tasks to make sure the engagement is as positive as possible. Again, we're going to take questions from the YouTube live chat function. Um, I'm assuming that's working, Adam. Yes, all working, all absolutely fine. And any abuse so far? No, or we... <laughs> not yet, Tom. Good, not, not yet. yet. Oh, good. Thank you for the positivity there. I like, it. <laughs> um, and I'm late. Uh, and, and at the end, I'm going to ask what Ashton Peter and Jean's favourite online resources are. So it's very much the, the obvious first question. Tell us more about more. Well, more same less. Dot. Okay, who wants to take the screen? If I stop sharing, it's it's now not me. Somebody wants to take the screen in. Tell us more about it. Uh, so I mean, I can tell you how it started. Cool. Um, so I'd had the idea sort of in the background. I'd been introduced to um, these sorts of tasks a good few years ago through John Mason uh, and his sort of iconic first one around area and perimeter that I think was most people's first introduction to them if they'd seen them before. Ashton, have you got that in your I've Twitter? got that ready if you want me to share it. Yeah. yeah. That's and the beauty was... of doing this, the, the, the kind of TV style thing. We can see what's going on as well. It's brilliant. <laughs> I don't want to, I don't oh, by the way, in case I haven't made this clear, we are determined to make these under an hour, no matter what. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Session for Good, because I've got a meeting afterwards. So. Well, in which case, <laughs> um, but I, I want people to be able to commit to these and say it's only an hour. So all of these sessions should be no longer than an hour. That's the plan. So this is the John Mason task. Yes. yes. So this, this was, was the, the original first one, one I used as well. Um, the sorry, go on, Pete. No, 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 no. Yeah. So this was this was the original one that I I came across years ago. I used to before I moved back. To the Midlands I used to work in Oxford and I, I had the privilege of working with uh, John and Dan tutoring their PGCE students out of Oxford University amongst other things yeah. um, and sort of this task for me was brilliant and I kept sort of coming back to it and I, I had the idea of creating a website where there were more of them available and, and spanning a wider area and it just so happened at sort of the same time that I was thinking about putting this website together, Ashton shared one on Twitter. Um, and so I got in touch with Ashton. Ashton and I knew each other from uh, LaSalle's conferences and things like that anyway. Um, so I got in touch with Ashton and said, I had an idea for a website around these things. Is it something you'd be interested in collaborating with? And Ashton was really, really keen to collaborate with uh, with me on producing the website. So we did a lot of work sort of around the early, around Christmas period and um, stuff like that, putting it all together and then launched it at one of the LaSalle conferences in March where we did a joint presentation, Ashton's first presentation, which went down a right storm actually. Um, but yeah, so we did a joint presentation on it in March where we, where we launched the site. Um, and that's that had, I think it was something like... Uh, can't remember exact number something like 30 or 40 grids on there at the time across yeah. different bits and then it was Ashton actually that suggested it would be really good to have some primary bits in there and Ashton had, had made contact with Jean and as I understand Jean how many were loaded on this morning all primary 40 wow um the thing is I saw Ashton's and I got a bit obsessed with it <laughs> and um I couldn't go out throughout the day without having a notebook and scribbling some down because they were just all coming out. I mean, it really is going to slow the pace fairly soon. Um, but uh, initially, it just became quite obsessive for me because I thought it was such an amazing idea and I'd never seen it before. But there's so much potential for primary. So we start introducing what this task is because obviously it's on screen. Um, Ashton, you said it was the first one you obviously got excited about it. Can you talk through what this task is? Yes. So it's, and I think this task is, it's a really good way in for most students because all, all they have to do is really shape the boxes. Um, so you've got this, you've got in the middle, you've got one, two, three, four, five, six, uh, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11. I don't really know why I counted like that. It would have been embarrassing had you got that wrong, to be honest. I know, I know. Um, I, was like, I was like counting in my head in a different way to how I was counting on screen, which was really confusing me. Um, so there's a let, like the shape in the middle has an area of 11 square units. And you've got to, to vary the area, getting more, same or less. And you've got to, at the same time, vary the perimeter, less, same or more. And it's really nice because it's directly comparing two concepts that students always get confused mm -hmm. and get mixed up about. And 
the the kind of bizarreness of the shape lends itself really nicely and it, it really the idea that if you cut certain bits out the perimeter increases but if you cut like the corners bit bits out the perimeter stays the same and there's so many ideas that they can take from that and that they can gain from that um and the, there's so much you can discuss within this task and yeah i just think it's really nice um and it's a great starting point because everyone can kind of access it like at the end of the day for the area they're just counting and for the perimeter they're just counting but it really highlights that the perimeter is the boundary of the shape and the area is the the inside um, there's a lot of people who refuse to teach area and perimeter together don't they because the the, the the two topics one's multiplication one's addition one's length one's area they're completely different things and you'll get pupils who get confused and when you teach them together that confusion can happen However, I can see why people, and this is a great task to help divide the two. It really but, is. But they don't have to be taught together initially. So you can no. teach perimeter, you can teach area separately, and then be like, right, we've got these two ideas. People always get them mixed up. Let's let's combine them. Let's see how they interact. With each other. Let's see how they interact. Let's see their relationship. And for after this, after this task, when I first used it, you can you can show them um, you can show them all kinds of perimeter problems where there's loads of sides not labeled and they can almost work it out. They're like, well, that won't change the perimeter because I know if I take away from the corner, the perimeter doesn't change. And it's, yeah, it's very accessible. And by trying to get them to keep it the same as possible, they really build up that understanding from this task. Should we demonstrate one? Um, now I know I made one with, um, which is a, a, a primary one actually. Um, I think you've all seen it. I think I sent it to you, Sally Pete and Ashton. Shall I put that one on? Yeah. Go for it. Um, because like Eugene, I was like, ooh, my first feeling was, how am I going to um, introduce this task? And so you try and find an easier one. This is my example. Um, and one thing that I, I, I say about all the sessions that I'm doing is um, I don't think I'm getting it all right. Pe I, I like people to watch these, challenge this, and say, I don't like this idea. I want to extend it. So, you know, finding my idea and then changing it slightly, uh, or any idea you hear, if you go away and think about it yourself. Uh, right, so here we go. So I tried to make one, and uh, given the fact I've been making this hoo-ha about trying to use the right language, um, we've got the, I've got a subtraction in the middle, and, and, and feel free to criticise us on this. I'd like to improve it as you go along. Uh, we've got a um, subtraction in the middle, 15 take away 9 equals 6. And in the top right there, the parts of subtraction, so you've got the minu end, Subtract the subtrahend equals the difference. Uh, and so I went for difference and subtrahend. And how we, we'll talk maybe in a bit about how to create these and how, because you, you, you three have got more experience in creating these than I have, where you start from if you want to create your own, because the website welcomes contributions as well, doesn't Absolutely, it? Absolutely. Yeah. Keep if you've made one, add it to the website so everyone can use it. Again, that's what I love about maths online at the moment. Um, and so let's start with, in fact, I'll just click and see what goes first. So the same subtrahend. Oops, have I made a mistake already? <laughs> I think you might have. Brilliant. No matter how many times I check this <laughs> over and over again. Now, have I done the same menu end? <laughs> so hold on, let's yes, just... I think you've done the same menu yes. end. Right, so hold on, hold on. Let's pretend this didn't happen. <laughs> At least we caught it before you'd used it with kids properly. Yeah, we're, we're not. Ah, good point. That's one thing that I know you both said to me in email. Everyone said this you must do the task beforehand. Yeah. So, as I was saying, the menu end, uh, the first note, we've got the same menu end there, uh, but the, the difference is more. Have I got it right this time? Yes, because yes. you reduced the subject good. head. Lucky we're not live, so it doesn't matter. It's fine. Um, now, what's happened though, when you've kept the menu in the same, but the difference is more, what's happened? And I suppose that's the, 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 the pupils will notice that the, the, um, the subtrahend has decreased. Okay, I feel under pressure here. Uh, and, and one thing I, I tell my trainees is we're, we're supposed to do maths, we're allowed to make mistakes. Uh, do you three get the same as me, by the way, you're a maths teacher? And if you ever get any numbers wrong, Oh, it's all, it's all the time, <laughs> yes. We're allowed to make mistakes. We're supposed to embrace mistakes. Um, okay, so I, I like mistakes. I'm going to make plenty of them. Uh, the menu end here, the difference is less. So therefore, if you notice this term, the subtrahend has had to increase. Now, this is a really nice task which you could use with counters, really nice task with bar modeling, etc. Um, part, part, whole. 
uh, really enjoyable. So now I've gone for a menu end. The menu end is more, so I've increased from 15 to 16. The difference is the same, so therefore I had to increase the subtrahend. Yep, now it might be, uh, some people think there's a bit too much going on here if you're introducing this language for the first time. Uh, because, uh, Gene, I know you'll be, oh, well, I'll, I'll say this and, and Pete National feel free to disagree. Primary schools are better at using this proper language than secondary schools currently across the country. Well, I'm watching um, base on this. <laughs> there's, there's a mix, there's a mixed picture, but um, uh, yeah, I mean, some schools use that language, um, others don't use it so much. It's, it's a real mixed picture. It, I mean, I suppose I talk about consistency and it's a shame if people don't use the same language. Um, and I, 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 Pete, I think it's itchy to say something here, but, um, but I, I, I hope there's consistency because we're all teaching maths, whether we're primary or secondary, we're all teaching the same subject and we've got to build on to, onto each other. Pete, have you any thoughts on this, on the language I'm trying to use here? Uh, it's correct, certainly. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, secondary, I would say there are people starting to embrace it, particularly because it, we are starting to see it from the primaries now. Mm -hmm. Kids are familiar with this language more as those kids that have been working with teachers who are familiar with the teaching for mastery ideas are coming through to secondary schools. So I think it's increasing, but like Jean said, I'm still a very mixed picture. I mean, again, because there's so much being shared online and the math subs are certainly, they've had a bigger impact in the primary school, in the primary sector, uh, and it's growing in the secondary. And by the way, teaching for mastery specialists applications end on Monday, I think. And I retweeted Indeed. this morning. Uh, so I want to make sure I did mention that for everybody today. Um, and again, this isn't an NCTM loving. Uh, and I want to make sure that's clear. It has inspired me. And look what it's done for Ashton, you know, uh, you know and, and the work that Pete and Jean do as well. Um, but it, it's made me think a lot more about my pedagogy. Anyway, back to this task. So oh, just really quickly, Do just quickly, yeah. um, and maybe something to keep in the back of your mind when you're introducing all of these grids. Um, when would you, you when would you introduce them to a class? Would you use them as a starter? Would you use them as um, during the lesson? Like, at what point? Would you introduce um, using these grids? We'll talk, we'll do that in a bit. If that's all right, shall we make keep that separate? So we'll go through this task and the intricacies that that appear during it, because th there are answers to all of these, and there's going to be tasks that don't have those. So we'll we'll give it its place in the lesson a little bit later on in the hour. But we will do that. Don't worry. Thanks for asking whoever that was. Um, so again, in this instance here, the difference is the same, uh, I believe. Yes, I have to check again. Uh, so the minuend went less, so therefore the uh, subtrahend increase. Uh, Oh, decrease. yes, they both had to decrease in this instance. Correct. Nice. Uh, now, I'm just going to move those on because in this instance, everything works. And that's nice and that's useful. And be I think before, you, before you do, uh, before you m move on, yeah. now, what's really interesting there is, um, you, and this happens a lot, is all of those numbers are whole numbers. And then someone finishes it and then, or oh, say, oh, I've finished, I've done it, but, well, What's what's more similar to nine, eight or uh, eight point nine kind of thing, and like why is it closer? And you can you can bring in decimals, and then it's a whole it's a whole like extension to the the task, and without any extra work. And, and that with that in mind, uh, I know I sent you a separate question that at the moment there aren't answers on the website, and let's talk why now because they are answers, <laughs> but you don't want people to think they're the right answers. Exactly. I think oh, precisely, yeah. end anyway. I um, think that if you have if you have answers, it someone will look and they'll see some answers and then they'll be like, okay, and they'll just kind of scan through them almost. Because I, I, I do it myself. If I'm looking at a resource, I'll kind of and I'm not, you know, if, if I'm in a bit of a rush, sometimes I'll just like scan through the answers and not pay a lot of attention to the maths. However, with not having the answers, you have to actually do it. And then you can notice and see connections yourself. And there is, for most of these grids, not all of them, but for most of them, there is multiple ways you can answer every single question. And I wouldn't want, um, I wouldn't want like a teacher to just put up some answers on the board and say, all right, mark it. And then kids have got something different, which is correct. And then think they've got it wrong. I think the answers for these grids is quite important and you should spend time going through them. Maybe like, maybe like, a good amount of time discussing them. Okay, so and so's got this, so and so's got that. Are they both correct? Why are they both correct? 
what how how are the, their answers related to each other and and I think it I think that is just as important part of the task as the kids doing the grids themselves that discussion that comes afterwards absolutely yeah a big part of these tasks is around the recognizing something that you perhaps wouldn't have recognized before or wouldn't have noticed before and so if you if you if you give teachers or pupils just here are the answers well actually that detracts from that you know it, i would like and i do i do get them when i do this i get kids that surprise me with their thinking when they say when they say oh well i put this in here i hadn't even considered that but yes i can <laughs> see where your thinking is there you get kids that surprise you with your thinking with that and it's you know it's really it's a really nice outcome from using these with students so i wouldn't want that to be sort of locked down by saying no this is the answer we are looking for for this i, I put this uh, suggestion up on twitter earlier on in the week and, and oddly enough just what you're saying about the answers i'm just gonna but uh, go back to that there was how oh, i put it so aha someone tweeted this and we'll do this later on uh, so i do want to make sure this is acknowledged in case people are thinking it now how do people mark these grids at all is it teacher during the lesson or after the lesson um, so we'll, we'll come to that in a moment when we've introduced it into the lesson. This was the example I showed earlier in the week. Go away, go away, go away. Aha. Um, and what you were saying there about the little differences. So for the gradient to stay the same, where I'm moving my arrow now, uh, in fact, we'll go here. For the gradient to the same, well, actually, more could be uh, y equals 3x plus 2.1, 2.01, 2. And, and the conversation of, uh, of place value, as you, as you were just saying. But these have to be... 3x. I, I think I made a suggestion on, on, on Twitter about you could then extend this to being all equal zero. Uh, so ax plus by plus c equals zero. And, and they've then got to manipulate it and, and, and change both sides. Because um, that, that's the standard form. Uh, standard, non-standard. We'll do that next Friday. Um, <laughs> but that's the standard form. But what has to say the same, what has to change? And there was a lovely suggestion from Sudi at Boss Maths because uh, these are really versatile tasks um for this um what was it for this one after using it as intended so filling in each of the boxes uh, might relabel them a to h and then say uh, as he's put there three minus two x which one would that be in which box a b c d e a uh, that's a really nice idea absolutely these sessions to be where it's not just here's a resource use it adapt it extend it to your classroom think about different ways of asking questions because that there is everyone holding up a whiteboard and you've got everybody's answer and everyone's got a clue what's going on great afl i love whiteboards um and then, and then obviously it lends itself to you know that's different answers then provoke more discussions as a class as well um and I, I i that that comment was brilliant i thought that was a really good idea yeah Shall we, shall we, um, uh, again, I'm happy to, I will give up the screen because I'm taking too much fun here. Um, what about introducing it to the classroom then? So would, the, the one I've used with the menu end, I got it right. Would that be the way, um, a, a, an easier task? Or how would you introduce these tasks to your pupils? Who wants to jump in? No one. Okay. Um, <laughs> well, well, I mean, I could tell, go on, Ashton. No, you go, you go first. Uh, go I can tell you, I mean, how I've introduced them in the past uh, and obviously, once you've introduced them once or twice to a class, they, they then get in, get the idea of what they're about. So there's different introductions uh, that you can play once kids are familiar with the idea. But how I would typically introduce them to a class is obviously, you know, explain what, how, what the structure looks like. So perhaps give a specific example. In this box, both of these things have got to be increased. You've got these two things that you're looking at and both of these things have got to be increased in this box i might point out specific boxes and things like that that kids have got to fill in uh if kids are struggling to sort of get started i might focus their attention just on one box and say can you put anything in there can you put something in there that would that would fit the criteria and then sort of try and wheedle it down okay is there something closer to the original one that you could put in there is there something closer to the original one that you could put in there? And then once they've got that idea, move them onto a different box, something like that. Mm -hmm. And would, But once you've done that with kids sort of two or three times, they get the idea and they get used to that structure and it's a structure that they can keep coming back to. So mm -hmm. after having used a couple in the class, when you put one up or you give one out, kids are like, oh, okay, I know what I'm doing with this now. I, I really want to reiterate something you said there, Pete, because uh, a lot of teachers... Uh, when they're trying something new, oh, the kids didn't like it. 
and you pointed out two or three times, give it a chance, please. You know, doing it once, oh, the kid didn't like it, I'm not going to do that again. Um, but let's imagine key stage three, then we'll work down to key stage two. Key stage three, what would be the, an example of one where you're thinking those first times you want to show them? Now, I've tried one there with subtraction. Because I use bigger words that they may not see before, I think that would take away attention. Um, but I thought, you know, doing this live, I had to try and look intelligent, and I failed. Um, <laughs> so any suggestions of a task you'd use for key stage three pupils? And then, Jean, ask you how you'd introduce, uh, what would be your introduction task to try and show the task? So any thoughts, Pete and Ashton, on what you'd use mm -hmm. first? Yeah, I, John Mason's original task is brilliant because as I said, it's just shading and counting. So if you are doing area and perimeter, that's a really good one to use. Um, all, like what Pete said was brilliant about kind of doing modeling the boxes. So just making sure you're spending lots of time modeling boxes. You can even get them to do like an answer to a box on the whiteboards and then compare and then, oh, why is there more similar than yours? Um, and I haven't actually done this. However, quite a few people have suggested this um, have suggested having almost cards that you like the first time you do it um, and cutting them out and set place and then them in each box. Now, I don't think that's like long term, you know, you, you want them to be generating their own examples. Yeah. Like it's really powerful that they are generating their own examples. But as a starting point, it gives them it, it helps them understand the structure of the grid. Um, and it just gives them a way in which you might want to use when you first use it. That's so, a really good idea. Honestly, yeah, that's really just jumping idea. in on the chat on YouTube. That's what people are suggesting they would do to introduce it is by using a card sort first. And I've um, got and one. Taking that away. That, um, well, that's nice that someone's watching. So good. We can't <laughs> tell. So we're, we're, we're pleased about that. Ashley, you think you've got one there, do you say? Yeah, I've got one. Uh, can you see my screen again? Yeah. Yep. Yep. Brilliant. That should, oh no. That scared me when it said nope. connected and disconnected your keyboard thing earlier. I thought my computer was oh. failing, so. No, now it's going, it's going here. Just while Ashton's doing that on the chat as well, people are talking about using them on mini whiteboards, using them on um, smart, smart boards, getting the kids up, writing them on um, kind of the whiteboards as well. So having that interactive nature and the discussion around it as well, which is really good. Yeah, absolutely. And that, again, you know, that's why when we produce them on the website, we put them into PowerPoint form so that they can be displayed, they can be printed, they can be done however, uh, they can be used in whatever way a teacher wants to use them with a class. Go on, Ashton, you got your card there. Yeah, so I, I, I hadn't even seen this. However, I was doing, I was talking to some people about this uh, the other day, um, and this was suggested. Someone said, oh, look, I've... Someone mentioned this, um, and that could be a really good way in because you've got the shapes there, you cut them out, and you place them into the grid. Uh, the, this, the axes are slightly different on the grid here, but you could just change that. It's not much of a hassle. Um, and that way, they it just gives them a bit more of a prompt. They don't need to generate it them, the, themselves for the first one. And then, you know, you can, once they've seen it and they understand the more and the same more and more and that structure then they can they can go on to generate in their own there's a, there's another idea to this as well that the teacher could place those pictures into the grid completely incorrectly and ask the children why are they not in the right place and to correct them Lovely. so there's a, a mistakes type activity that could emerge from this yeah, and just to follow up on that, on on the chat, people have said you could put them, fill them all in, remove the um, labels, and get the students to write down the labels from seeing a complete grid, mm. um, which might be quite nice as well. Yeah, nice idea, really nice idea. This is great. <laughs> <laughs> you I mean, also it's... use something simple like this. One second, um, gone. Mine, this is a tangent, so you go Pete first. and then No, I'll... no, no, you crack on, matey. Okay. So, like, something very simple. And you could even do even numbers if you don't want to do prime. So, number of numbers, number of even numbers. And you just model that as a class. Um, because most people in key stage, if you just, like, so you don't, you may be, maybe do even numbers so it's even easier. But then it's, it gets them, gives them a sense of what the grid is. So, something, like, way beyond what they're capable of because i think like 
if they try it and they struggle with it and they're like, this was really difficult and it, it is difficult. These are challenging. They're not easy. If they, if they struggle and don't feel successful, they might be reluctant to do the grids again. So you, you want to really start like with grids that they'll definitely be able to do that will challenge them, but they'll be successful at so that they associate them with, you know, that thinking, but also success. If that makes sense. And of course, prime numbers. I remember Pete responding to a tweet I did at Christmas time. Uh, prime numbers have two distinct factors. And I remember you writing it in quite adamant words. Those are the words we use not to abide by and blah, blah, blah. Prime numbers have two distinct factors. Gene, can you give us some examples of how maybe you'd introduce it? And, and what years would you um, be keen to introduce in, um, in, in primary as well? Well, currently I'm even getting some early years teachers to trial out um, making really large versions that cover the floor. Um, so um, they're on there, but I just, um, I want to get some feedback about it, some tweets that needed, but key stage one, certainly onwards. And this whole more same less structure as well is very much connected in primary to their experiences of the Carol diagram, which you know, they might know what even numbers are or prime numbers, but it's then when they have to, have to actually put it into that Carol diagram, it's the structure they struggle with, not the actual yeah. um, labels. So um, if I'll just show you how I might have a look at this in primary. So this is one that I filled out regarding place value, because this is a big topic um, if we think about September, everyone in primary is looking at place value. Um, so this is numbers less than 500 and um, thinking about as much as possible, keeping to those digits of um, 234. Now, this is a, an example, but um, as everyone has said, we don't want to be giving them answers. And sometimes these answers might not be possible as well. It's quite overwhelming. So I thought in the first instance for primary to just blank out lots of the squares and just to look at one square and start to think about um, some numbers that could go in there and then start to expand it a little, a little bit more fully. Um, and as we know, on its own, it's a really collaborative task anyway. But if we um, were thinking about time limits because for one child to do this in primary um, and having done a few already it takes a bit of time so one thing that i thought would be um really nice is thinking about a jigsaw activity where you number them up and each table does a different part of the more same less grid and then um, there's a representative from each of those that come together and discuss what went in there so that we're starting off by essentially doing a little bit of it and start to expand it as the children grow in confidence. I got the idea there that if, imagine um, as you've done there one to eight and one table comes up with their answer of one and then you pass it to the next table and they have to come up another one that's one but not the same. And of course, when they see the answers, they'll start seeing what's the same, what's different. Um, love that question. Um, yeah, that's a really nice way of doing it. It's a lovely way to introduce it. So are you, um, does everyone think that, I suppose when you start with these, this is better as a discussion activity, not as an independence activity to, to begin? I think it depends on where you're bringing it in at the, to, to the lesson. If you're bringing it into the lesson, um towards the beginning or as one of the early activities you do having looked at a concept or things like that um i've used them for students just doing independently doing on their own but typically after they've done other things to help them secure the concept so i, I would run a lesson where again coming back to say the the area and perimeter one where kids have looked at area having previously looked at perimeter or something like that and then set we've, we've done some work securing the idea of area calculating area counting area whatever um whatever the focus of that lesson is and having done some things to secure that idea it's then right okay 
now let's have a go at this and and at that point kids can do can have a go at those individually independently and we can talk and share later on about what we've got but at the same time you could do that in a group setting or you could do that um sort of coming up to the class as as a, as a whole class discussion but i don't think there's necessarily you know that, that kids can't do them independently I think it would be where you fed it into the lesson would dictate the best way that students would then work on a task like that. I think we're gradually um, going into the question that asked earlier on about when it can be used in the classroom uh, and acknowledging people on Twitter as well. Laura um, said about one sheet each talking as they do. I think we've just been covering that. Many answers per box. So Jean, the idea of passing it round and, and going around the classroom, that very, very much covered that one, which is nice. Uh, hashtag resourceful. Uh, we, we never know. We might train. We might get five people who message. Um, so when can it be used in the classroom? I think there's there's two different things here. There's how to introduce it, which I think we've covered, because it would need its own focus. Uh, you're not going to get a whole lesson on, let's say, perimeter. You did area a few weeks ago. Oh, let's quickly do this new task in 20 minutes. I think we've covered how to introduce this task, which probably needs a lesson in itself, um, you know, following previous lessons on what you've taught. Um, but what about its use when the kids are more used to the task? Um, I mean, I've just written something about it. I, I, um, give them as the sheet when they walk in, somewhat similar to what you said, Ashton, and tell them there are five errors on the sheet, find them. Um, and that would be, a, a, you know, when they're used to the task, that would be quite a nice starter task. Um, but then again, it could be used later in the lesson. So um, Ashton, I know you did a session a few weeks ago and it's where I started thinking about it more and more. I didn't see this as a, I've just taught that. Well, in fact, is there the area of trapezium one? You've got that on your screen, Ashton. Can we get that up? Yeah, yeah. Um, um, get that on screen. So I thought this was a really nice one. Um, and it really is a matter of what we're changing, what stays the same, talking about variation next Friday. Um, so here's the idea that the total area, you start with that trapezium in the middle uh, and the difference between the length of the parallel sides. Uh, in other words, currently the five. Um, no, sorry. So no, I've, and this, I've... this is a really interesting thing, actually, because Ashton and I um, had a conversation about this one a uh, week or two ago. That difference between the parallel sides is oh, no. the difference yes. between the values. Yes. Uh, yes. And I, I'd interpreted it, Tom, exactly the same way as you did, as basically another way of describing the height. But Ashton's, in, Ashton's intention with that one when he designed it was the difference between the values of what would typically be labelled A and B. Uh, we had a quite answers, a little chuckle about that. So yeah, I've I've changed the label now, but I, I don't even know which one I prefer because I think both are both are quite valid options. Um, so whether you're changing the height or so yeah, I've ruined I've ruined all your answers. I'm sorry. But the isn't, that, aliens, um. <laughs> isn't that showing how important it is the importance of the words we use and, and yeah, making sure we're as clear as possible? Because what we think is clear, mm. it, it's ambiguous there, and so you're absolutely right. The six and the ten. Um, so it becomes seven and eleven. Yeah. Okay. Um, now I can't remember what my point was about this. Oh, this, that was it. So you've just taught area of a trapezium. Going straight to this doesn't feel right to me. So you've just demonstrated it. Maybe you've done your, your examples on the whiteboard. I've got my whiteboard here. So I do my examples on the whiteboard. I've done my AFL. Now you go off, kids. I don't think this is the time for that. This activity. I think that it's got to be some practice first before they challenge this. But any thoughts from you? Yeah, so I'd say that some grids can be used quite quickly because it depends what they've met before. And, you know, they do, they do a lot of maths in primary. And this may be, they may have covered it before, they may have covered it in previous years. So sometimes you can use it quite quickly to check what they, or to like revise a topic almost. Um, but this one, this one, I'd say I'd want them to have done some practice beforehand. And mm. I would probably use kind of like Craig Barton style, minimally different questions where the, where one thing is changing so that they, they're making the connection between those, like le the different lengths and how it affects the area already. So they've kind of got a base coming into this task. And then this, this extends it further by making them generate the kind of conjectures and the, the things they noticed during the the practice beforehand if that makes sense i'm a steve lomax fan and he talks about do it twist it solve it uh, and for me that's fluency reasoning problem solving i'm seeing gene nodding 
Uh, and this is a lot of reasoning. A lo it's, it's problem solving and discussion. Mm. The language involved with this. Jean, what's your thoughts to when you introduce this task? Yeah, well, I mean, particularly as well with younger children, I think it all starts with the what if question. So that you've you've got whether it's a calculation or this trapezium that you're actually just taking out of the grid initially and asking the children, well, what if we did this to it? So what if we did that? Have you got any other what ifs? Because if you get children into that culture of the what if, then this becomes actually quite easy because they start to see those other possibilities and the changes because um, that's embedded in the pedagogy that you use. Um, so I think for primary, it starts with the what if. Any other thoughts as to when to use this? I mean, I think we've come um, up with examples as to find the errors, um, discussions. I, I love the scaffold of putting where to put it. That's just such a nice little introduction. Pete, you've had more experience teaching these. Any any other kind of when have you used them? Well, it was uh, actually it was interesting hearing both you and Ashton talk about practice there because I think we you know and this, this could get into a long discussion that would take us way over the hour. But what we mean when we talk about practice and mechanical repetition and things of that nature. If we if we take something like this, I think the, the the difference between some of the grids is the the need to be undoing things as opposed to doing things. And obviously, if people have read John Mason in particular around doing and undoing, um, there's a lot of undoing needed in this grid. You know, once you've calculated that initial area, and you're trying to increase another area, you're trying to increase it in trying to increase that area and come up with another trapezium you've got to kind of almost undo from knowing the area to what the trapezium might look like. And typically, undoing is much harder than doing. So there are some of the grids that are on the website where there is a lot of doing and less undoing. And I think those are probably more the sort of grids that might be used as early practice. This one in particular, there is a lot of undoing that's got to be done. And I think that's where kids will find a bit more security with the with the idea of doing finding the area of a trapezium will be helpful before they sort of access this but i think every teacher in every classroom has who knows their kids has to make that decision about when is the right time to put this in and it will depend on the grid it will depend on the kids it will depend on prior knowledge it will depend on all sorts of things i had one idea of maybe putting in nine trapezia here and these are the ones you've all got to work out. So those are your, your practice questions. And then saying, are any of them in the wrong place? Uh, and then move them around would be a way. So, it, it, so instead of there being two resources, they're almost at the same time, considering I, I, I'm doing the procedure, because I do need that practice. Uh, and we'd rotate it maybe just to make them think a little bit, uh, you know, make them look different. Um, but then possibly I've now got it in the wrong place. I need to move it to this box. Maybe that's a bit too much going on. I think that, that, to be honest, I would prefer for them to just do some other practice separate from practice first, because mm. I think, I think the, the generating of, of examples themselves and is really important. And the, there's more, the undoing is important. If they, they can, they definitely understand something if they can do the undoing and what the working backwards almost. And, you know, it's fine if they use a bit of trial and error. If they if they think, if they say, for instance, say, oh, I think that top one should be eight, and then they try it with eight, and then they're like, oh, that was a that wasn't quite right. How can I change it? How can I make it different? And you know, I don't expect them to look at it and to be able to work them out like work backwards. But it's kind of thinking, it gets them thinking. Okay, what do I need to change? All right, let's try this number. So like specializing. Okay. How does that affect it? Oh, well, that happened. Okay, whatever changed this bit? And if you draw their attention to, to some of these changes in the practice before they do the grid, then they might be a bit more ready to attack it. So kind of build them up. So I would probably start with some completely just unrelated numbers yeah. and we're, we're scaffolded, um, like I'm really scaffolded, like four out of the five steps are complete, then three out of the four, five, and then two out of the five. So really just getting them happy with the procedure. Then just four or five questions like that. Then some kind of minimal different questions where you're just changing one thing. 
and then this grid. And that kind of would be a, a nice journey through air of trapezium for me. Jean, any thoughts on that? Was that the, the kind of similar out, out way you'd look at it? I'd, I'd say absolutely. I would use that approach in primary. Um, I was just thinking about another thing. There's um, a website that I really like called samedifferentmath.com. And um, that takes two images and the children have to talk about what is the same, what is different. Um, and it could well be that you just take two of these trapeziums and ask them what is the same, what is different. And on purpose, you've chosen maybe one from the same column or from the same row so that they share similarities, but they're also different. And you have that discussion. Lovely. The, um... Uh, you mentioned a website there. Now we we determined to end by eleven o'clock, and at ten fifty-five, I need uh, so I've got four more minutes on this, and I'm going to be asking every time I do one of these resourceful shows, uh, I'm going to ask people about the, the online resources they like. Um, but the question I think that come out, how to mark them, was something mentioned to us. So I want to make sure we've covered that. So do you want me to also quickly us? show a grid that can't that has some ones that can't be done? Do you know what? Great idea. So we, we should point that that was my other thing I've highlighted. Of, there are some ideas that can't be done. So if you can share one of those, that'd be nice. Yeah. So there's two, there's two here. I'll just share one. Uh, this was submitted to the site. So remember, you can submit your own. Uh, this was by Emma McCray. Um, I'll just have a look at that. So where's the one? Which one can't be done? I don't want to do maths. I've got enough going around <laughs> my head. I'm trying to do Twitter. I'm trying to ask questions. I don't want to do maths. Hold on a second. Gene, any, any thoughts? <laughs> I'm, not, my, 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 I'm, 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 I'm mental overload at the moment, okay? The cognitive overload. We, we've learned about that. Go on, Ashton, tell him. All right, so... so tell here, me! So this is the value of the decimal number, all right? So this, yep. it has to be 0.55. Yeah. It has to have the same value. But if I had an extra zero, so 0.55, Five five zero, and you may you may want to say it as zero and five tenths and five hundredths and zero thousandths. It depends how you want to say it. But just going with the not point five five zero, that could go there. That is valid. However, this box yeah, can't, can't have the same value and have less decimal places. Exactly. Thank you for showing me up. I appreciate that a lot. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's all right. It's all right. Um, how to mark them then? So let's say they've done it either independently or as pairs, so not the big jigsaw activity. Um, I think we talked about that as to how we'd be able to discuss how all the answers uh, would be the same. And I think there's different conversations. So if this was given to individuals or maybe pairs, how would you as the teacher, 10, 15 minutes left, mark these? So I personally, for me, one of the big values in this is the discussion that comes out of it afterwards. So wherever possible, the marking will come from talking to students about what they've put in there. We're asking students, you know, who's put something different in there, prompting those discussions, prompting those reflections. So for when I when I use these almost exclusively, the sort of exploration around the, uh, what's been what's happened within the class is how I would mark it. Um, if I have my own suggestions, I'm free to share those as well. But certainly. Um, through class discussion is is almost exclusively how I would go about doing these. I mean, there's nothing wrong necessarily with, you know, taking them all in and marking them, except for the workload, which is a real pain. Um, I propose that one. <laughs> <laughs> but you've got to think about what a student's getting out of that. And I think students would be getting less out of that than they would be by having to engage with other people's ideas, other people's thoughts about what they'd put in, um, and having to justify why theirs is the better answer than some of the others so for me absolutely the best way to use these in terms of marking them or feeding back to students on them is perhaps a better phrase is to is to collect thoughts from students and collect and sort of populate a central grid have that whole class discussion with what different things that people have put in Jean, any different to that no i would say it was exactly the same um However, if I was if I was just going to introduce these um, and it was the first week, I might just look at one square a day really quickly. So then that's easy to discuss various possibilities and a place value topic, say, lasting two or three weeks. We can just keep going back to that daily until the whole grid is filled. 
lovely idea. Um, we're getting really close now. It, it's frustrating because I know I could talk for another hour, but I did a session before the holidays, the half term um, holidays, for those who had holidays. Thing. Please do. Oh, well, just, just it, possible, on, ways to, possible ways to extend it. So if someone's finished, uh, just get them to fill in the box in a different way. And uh, so this is something that I saw that Chris McGrain did. He he said he added a, he made it a five by five, even more, even less. So there's loads of ways that you can extend that there. I saw a half same double, if it's appropriate. So to make the area half, make it double, uh, mm. and you've got to think ahead. I mean, for me, the, the five big idea. This is mathematical thinking variation, so beautifully intertwined. Um, but the representation can come in as well when you're going through that reasoning. It, it really is superb understanding. Um, as I said, I wanted to keep to now because I asked for a session before the, the, the holidays. Uh, 200 people voted and it was very clear, keep them to an hour so people can engage. So we're nearly there, but I had a really big issue. And I do have to spend a minute of those final four minutes doing this because I've spent the time, so I'm going to do it. Um, I had a big issue when creating this series of ideas because I needed to choose a name. Now, resourceful is what we've come up with now. Um, but still, I, I've been listening to my 80s music and this album, uh, Phil Collins. Uh, are you all aware of this album? Which album is it? <laughs> Not on screen. Oh, is that why? I was wondering why that wasn't happening. Okay, so... Is it the one you showed us before? Um, yeah, well, without other people knowing. Um, let me go back to the, the... There it is. Now I know what I'm doing. Sorry, thank you. I'm just full of mistakes today. Uh, so, classic album, classic 80s album. Uh, and I got this idea of no textbook required instead. Now, so I messaged some people and uh, Emma McRae, who I really respect, and she's like, it's a bit negative. And, and Joe Morgan said to me, it's a little bit negative. And I was like, okay, but the problem is I'd already got no textbook required into my head. Uh, and so, yeah, I'd like to point out that I'm not anti-textbook. I just want teachers to not blindly follow questions. Today's been all about why we're choosing questions. What are we trying to achieve from the lesson? What are we trying to achieve from their thinking? What do we get back? And again, I think what you said there, Pete, and, and Jean's really nice, uh, the conversation is probably the key mark. Well, it is the key mark uh, element of it. Uh, but I don't want people just to pick up their textbook and do questions one to 10, no thought given. And that's why I'm not anti-textbook. I just think online we've got so much. And so that's why I came up with this no textbook required name. And, and again, I love so much uh, how much there is shared online. Uh, and the problem is my brain started to keep going and I was like, well, no textbook required. Wouldn't it be funny if I did this? <laughs> uh, and then, well, you know, I, I, the beard's relatively new. <laughs> Um, but then, so I went to an old photo of me and, and then uh, a friend of mine did that. Um, and I was like, I, I can't not use this now. And then um, it kind of got worse. Oh no, don't tell me the music's not gonna work. Can we hear that? Yeah. Can you hear it? Yeah. Why well, can't? Okay, so this case, I, 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 I came up with a theme, you know, I don't know when do you- We can't hear you room. talking over it. <laughs> Oh, that's awful. Truly awful. Is this the feedback I was looking for? Um, anyway, so I'm going to keep going with no textbook required. Um, did that, uh, I mean, hmm, fine. What are your favourite online resources and why? And thankfully you've told me beforehand to save some time. Uh, so, Jean, you first. Tell This is your first choice. Yes, yeah, so my first choice, this is a website by a man called Gareth Metcalf. Um, he has lots of purchasable resources, but as you can see on there, you've got lots of free resources. There's some excellent resources on early number sense. The games are fantastic as well. And if you sign up to his website, he will send you anything he's trialing. So then you can um, try it out in your classroom and give feedback. Um, very much rich in reasoning and discussion. Um, I really, really like this website and I, the other resource I like from um, his website that I use to plan all the time is his big ideas because cool. that distills the um, national curriculum into the most essential elements. So you can make sure you're covering it um, properly. We're going to um, get two minutes over. Who cares? Math visuals. This was your other okay. choice. So this is a website set up by a gentleman that you can follow on Twitter called Berkeley Everett. And... Um, he creates these wonderful little video clips that take some of the really tricky concepts and makes them come alive. 
And he's also really up for ideas. So he'll post something and, or you can say, can you create something on this? And he's quite happy to start putting something together. It's just grown and grown as you can see, and it will keep growing. Highly recommended from early years right into secondary. Thank you, Jean. Pete, I think you were next and then you, you chose Enrich. Yeah, I mean, we do a lot of sort of, we, we have this sort of bright spark time where we um, sort of chat. It's, it's the space to make students think differently about what they might have seen in a lesson or in a, in a learning episode. And so we, we, we look for tasks for these, obviously more same less. We use those quite a lot. But two of my go-to places for, for tasks like that are the Enrich website. I mean, so much thinking behind all of the, the tasks that are in there. I mean, I'm sure maths teachers will be aware of it, but it, it's, it, it's one I go back to time and time again. And then obviously the other one is uh, Don Stewart's Medium blog. And again, the different prompts for thinking and the different uh, activities in there to challenge student thinking are just fantastic. So I, you know, when I'm designing materials and things like that, I can pretty much guarantee that if I'm trying to find something that, that I want students to think a little differently, but a more same less grid isn't appropriate for, for what I want on that case, those are two of the first websites I'll hit up. And, and thank you for that. Ashton, you chose this? Uh, yeah, so this, we use it as our homework department in our platform, um, which is absolutely incredible. It's a massive workload saver. There's so many great questions on there. It's completely free. Like he puts so much time into it, which is amazing. But he's also got loads of PowerPoints and he works at quite a high achieving grammar school. And I quite often look for his PowerPoint and say, okay, this is what his kids who will all be getting like nines and eights are, are doing. How can I get my kids there? So they're doing this same kind of level of work. Um, he uses loads of like UKMT questions in there, which are, which are brilliant for problem solving and stuff. And, and the other choice, um, this was just lovely. When this was the choice I made, I'm so pleased you've chosen this. We'll find out in about 30 seconds why, but why open middle .com? Just there's so much, um, there's so much kind of direction you can go in with these problems um, and kids can approach them like very differently. And there's, it just completely just changes the type of practice. Like they're still getting so much practice of it, but just in a completely different way. And they have to attend to the structure more. Um, and yeah, I just think they're really nice. Let's look at an example of one because this was resourceful number one. Um, and the no ticks but required song went down like a red, red balloon, but tell you what, it's probably gonna be at resourceful two anyway, uh, when I am joined by Robert Kuplinski of openmiddle.com. Um, now, because he's in America, he's on the West Coast, so eight hours behind. So he said midday his time. So it's going to be 8 p.m. this Wednesday. And that's going to be the time of the resourcefuls going forward. So Fridays, I'm going to do the five big ideas with primary specialists. Uh, Wednesday nights are going to be resourceful. Let's have a look at an example of what Ashton just said. There's, there's just your, your practice, your procedure. Four nights divided by three fifths equals two thirds. Look at this in comparison. Mm -hmm. Using the digits one to nine, at most one time each, Place a digit in each box to make two different pairs of fractions, two different pairs of fractions that have a quotient of two thirds. You've got to know what you're doing. You've got to understand it's the depth of knowledge that he talks about. He will do on Wednesday night. <laughs> um, and then look at the third problem he's put on here. Two, two pairs of, uh, pair of fra two fractions that are as close to four elevenths as possible. And of course, is four elevenths possible? Uh, and then you've got understanding the, the size of those fractions as well. So a lovely, um, lovely task. So it's open middle uh, this Wednesday night. The following Wednesday, you mentioned earlier on, Joe Morgan. Now, of course, her website's got so much stuff going on. Um, her gems, which you then share some of her favorite resources. So I'm going to be talking to her about her favorite resources and how she uses them. The topics in depth, which are really nice for CPD sessions. Uh, and of course, that massive resource library, and, uh, it kind of extends from her gems. So Resourceaholic, uh, a week on Wednesday. No. Yeah, a week on Wednesday, the 17th. I've got some other people lined up, but I'm not announcing them yet, um, but I'm really looking forward to doing these. Uh, it's at this stage where Gene, Ashton and Pete, I say thank you very much. For Thanks, Tom. Thank, you, thank, you, thank you very much. Uh, we'll see if I can come up with another theme tune, but I probably won't. Uh, if you do want to get in touch, send, uh, do to say some nice stuff on Twitter. Um, I will, um, I, I, Mess, well, I mentioned uh, Gene Aston and Pete's names on my Twitter, so go and follow them as well. 
Uh, if you want to resol- um, hashtag it, why not? But I've got a new email address for this. Uh, if you've got any suggestions or any questions for future guests, for Joe Morgan and for Robert Kopinski, resourceful at tommanners.co.uk. We were four or five minutes over, but, you know, and I made a few mistakes. I can edit those out next time and we'll make it an hour. Again, Pete, Aston and Jean, thank you so much. Thank you. No, Cheers very no much, problem. Tom. Love Best it. of luck. Yes, thanks. Thank you. Take care, everyone. And I will stop the online.